Are we all ready? Can we all sit down? <laughs> Are there any stragglers outside? Michael, sit down. <laughs> Jonathan, sit down. <laughs> Well, after, after a really interesting morning, I hope you're, you've all managed to get some lunch and feel refreshed for what's a, going to be a really interesting afternoon. And we're on the responsibility theme again, and we can't leave it really, because um, that's what it's about. Um, but more looking from through the horse's ears, looking forward now. Um, and so it's a great honour to introduce our next speaker, Roly Hours of World Horse Welfare, uh, an industry great and, you know, done an awful lot for the welfare of the horse already, but has been leading the conversations on social licence to operate um, at industry, UK and international level for some time now. So I think this is going to be a really, really interesting presentation that we must all pin our ears back and listen to. So, Roly, over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? I'm um, always very, very wary. Some of you have heard me say this before, but a great friend of mine was down in Australia, and he, he, we were always told when we were taught how to present uh, that you must ask if everyone can hear you in the room. And he went to Australia, and he forgot halfway through the presentation. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, can everyone hear me? And a chap at the front put their hand up and said, yes, I can hear you, but I'll be very happy to swap with someone who can't. Um, <laughs> Um, but anyway, my name's Roly, and Claire asked me to speak today, and um, so I was thinking about it on the way up. Claire and I are fellow directors of the British Horse Council. We are fellow directors of, the, of, of, the British, of British Question. We are on an organising committee for the National Equine Forum, and we're fellow members of um, the Worshipful Company of Saddlers. So when I'm rubbish, you know who to blame. Um, but anyway, I want to talk to you today about uh, social licence in, in horse sport. Um, and uh, not just in horse sport, but social licence generally. Specifically, um, it'll touch more on horse sport, but it, indeed it, it's obviously very relevant to the area of leisure as well. And especially what it means for equestrian trade. Now, this is my, not my normal sort of um, stomping ground in terms of who, who I, I talk to. So you'll have to bear with me. Um, the first three I'm very confident on. Um, I should be. I've, I've done it a few times, or especially talking about World Horse Welfare. I could speak to you about half, for half an hour about that, but I won't. Um, but it's at the responsibilities, and uh, Ruth talked about responsibilities, and when we talk about social licence, when we think about equine welfare, of course that brings responsibilities to all of us. But I also want to hopefully get across the importance and, and, and the, you know, the relevance of the opportunities that it brings us to collectively and I want to talk today obviously specifically within the world of equestrian trade. So I don't know how many of you will know much about World Horse Welfare. It's a charity that was uh, founded um, nearly 100 years ago and at our heart it's supporting the horse-human partnership and of course when we look across the world today that partnership features in so many different Ways we, we obviously think uh, uh, utilise horses as sport animals a lot in, in, in uh, developed countries of the world as, as leisure animals, but they're also used as animals for farming and as working animals. And as part of our role, we work in conjunction with others like the Donkey Sanctuary and Spana and the Brook. Where in the, in the world today, there's still over 100 million working equids supporting the livelihoods of over 600 million people. So that partnership with horses is as relevant today as it's ever been. In fact, I would say it's actually far more relevant today than it has been um, in, in our history and our heritage. And um, a key part of how World Horse Welfare works is through partnership and, and how I've got to know Claire so well, working through the likes of the British Horse Council and British Equestrian, but also through organisations like the National Equine Welfare Council. Because we know there's big challenges out there, and individually we, we can make a small difference. Together we can make a very large difference. 
But um, obviously today I want to talk a bit more uh, in terms of World Horse Welfare's role, and that's in the promotion of responsible horse sport. Now, I think I'm right in saying, uh, and I'm very happy to be challenged, but as far as I'm aware, we're the only equine welfare charity globally that actively supports responsible horse sport. Um, and I think, you know, within the, the context of social licence, I think that is so, so important, because we know with horse sport comes risk, and our, our responsibility is to reduce that risk as far as possible. And to show that the, the um, heritage of our work with, uh, within the sphere of responsible horse sport, um, we have been welfare advisors to the FEI since the 1980s, and in the 1990s uh, co-wrote the FEI Code of Conduct for the Welfare of the Horse with the FEI. And it's a code of conduct for the welfare of the horse that I think is central to so much what we do with horses, not only in horse sport, but in horse leisure. Because the FEI co code of conduct very clearly says that the welfare of the horse should never be subordinated to competitive or commercial influences. We can never have a win at cost a uh, win at all cost mentality. And if we do, then the future for horse sport and everyone associated with it will be very bleak indeed. But it's not only with the FEI do we have an association. Uh, we do have an association with the British Horse Racing Authority here uh, at home, um, but also uh, internationally with a number of different, informally with a number of different national federations. And you may be aware that the International Federation of Horse Racing Authorities and the FEI uh, came together and they formed the International Horse Sport Confederation um, a, a few years ago. And that is it's hopefully a very positive sign because the equestrian world is not always known for speaking with one voice. Um, and so the more we can collaborate together to face up to the challenges and the opportunities that we face is, is really good. So the IHSC, I think, is a really positive. And as closer to home, I, I mentioned earlier, we are also, World Horse Welfare is a, a member of British Equestrian. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of a, a flavour of what World Horse Welfare is all about, what our association with um, horse sport is all about, but also um, that promotion of the horse-human partnership. And if, in terms of, if you remember, if nothing else, just the, the, the promotion of World Horse Welfare in that sphere of, of horse-human partnership, that will be very helpful as we go on. So then, just to put this in sort of the context of the world we live in, because the ethics underpinning the horse-human partnership is increasingly being questioned by the general public, many of whom have a very little understanding or very unfamiliar with horses. Um, riding, and I'm sure many of us in the room ride, riding for us, of course, is a partnership. But for some, they would view that as exploitation, and indeed, some would even view it as abuse. And of, of equal relevance, there's a growing cadre of people who are involved in the horse world who are becoming increasingly vocally critical of elements of traditional horsemanship and practices in equestrian sport. And if we think of what's happened over the last year, and if we think of the headlines that um, horse sport has given us, um, uh, not just in the photos that I've shown, but we've had a racehorse trainer sitting astride a dead horse. We've had the women's modern pentathlon at last year's Tokyo Olympics. We've had BBC Panorama shining a light on the plight of ex-racehorses. And of course, earlier this year, we had um, the social media furore around the Mark Todd video. So it's no wonder that whatever the reality of how we are caring for our horses and managing and training our horses, if we are doing that well, but all the public are getting is this very sort of negative slant, uh, it's no wonder there's a potentially as a mismatch. But we know society is changing, and therefore we are on this ethical tightrope between... Um, what people would deem as acceptable and unacceptable. And we have recently done a piece of public opinion research around what people think around horse sport. And indeed, we might not be surprised to hear that one in five people believe that horses should never be used in sport. Most of those people, though, had no association or understanding or involvement with horses. But even in those who did have uh, an understanding and involvement with horses, uh, a proportion felt that 
that w horses should only be used in sport if their welfare is improved. So it's not just the general public out there, it's also people within the horse sector who are increasingly questioning what we're doing and how we're doing it. So whilst we know that there is a great change within society, and we can see that in terms of how we, um, our, our dietary preferences and our interaction, if we think of circuses um, and, and many other areas where actually the, man's involvement or human's involvement with, with animals is changing along with the environment, but so is our understanding of equine welfare. And what we mean by that is actually over the last um, years, we have a, a much better understanding of what constitutes good welfare. And that's what's crucial. When people talk about welfare, they'll often talk about nice stables, good veterinary care, good rugs, um, and a, a sort of a regular routine that a horse. Now, all of that, of course, is important to good welfare, but so is their mental well-being. And so it's really important when we think about good welfare to think about both their physical welfare and their mental well-being. And our understanding and our growing understanding of um, how horses learn and equine behaviour, for example, is increasingly questioning our traditional management of horses. And a key mantra of the charity is just because we've done something for hundreds of years, tens of years, or however long, doesn't necessarily make it right, in especially in the light of new evidence. And therefore, it is so important that collectively we keep an open mind and are happy to challenge the status quo. And when we think about what constitutes good welfare, many of you will have heard about the five freedoms. Um, and over the years, since the 1960s, when that was first pulled together, it has done the whole concept around the five freedoms has done an extraordinary amount to improve animal welfare, especially those animals that are used, utilised in a farming context. But in relation to how our understanding of animal welfare has changed, the five freedoms in the main is the avoidance of the negative. Um, and what is really important, yes, good welfare does partly constitute avoiding negative experiences for our horses, but equally as important is providing our horses with positive experiences. And that's why the five domains is such a good uh, um, a development of the five freedoms, where we think about nutrition, the physical environment, their health, and their behavioural interactions, which collectively uh, informs the mental state of that horse, which altogether has the welfare state of that horse. And of course, the equine trade can facilitate improvement in all five of these domains. And that's something really important to reflect on. So that's done half of what I wanted to cover. Uh, the, the, moving on to the third area, what do we mean by social licence? Because I'm very acutely aware that social licence can come up with ideas of management gobbledygook. Um, nothing could be further than the truth, but I hope I can explain to you what it is all about. Um, it's got nothing to do with the law. Social licence is an unwritten agreement between society um, and the activity being undertaken. To uh, the society trusts that activity to get on with whatever they are doing. And this can be uh, any activity. The concept of social licence is nothing new. It's over 200 years old. But very much came to prominence in the 1990s in the mining industry. Um, you might remember uh, since then too, but, but in the 1990s, some very high-profile accidents underground in mines. And therefore, public safety is a really important aspect of what mining companies um, undertake. But what was equally growing in the 1990s was a growing understanding of the environmental impact mining had. So you had the commercial reality of your company, the sustainability and the environmental impact, but also the human and safety impact. And the more enlightened mining companies recognised that if they were to succeed, uh, they would have to invest in all three of those elements to create a successful outcome. And that is very much what we believe, um, and many in, in horse sport and racing are already doing this, but so much more needs to be done to actually bring people with us to understand what we're doing to protect the number one stakeholder in the horse-human partnership, which is the horse. 
And one thing to really sort of stress here, this is not about mob rule. Yes, we live in a social media world where something can be whipped up into a storm within seconds. But what the social license is all about is actually recognising that you need to understand why that furore happened in the, uh, in the first place. We can't simply ignore it. Um, and so if we don't ignore it and we do accept that sometimes we might have to change the way we do things, we might have to change our rules, change our management, other times we need to stand up and say, no, what happened here was understandable and indeed was justifiable. And we need to be very clear about how we can um, state that case um, uh, through through our uh, communications, and communications does become a really important part of what social licence is all about. So when we think about social licence, the state of a social licence can define a sector's future. If it is healthy, then uh, the, the great benefit is it will allow the world, to, 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 it will, uh, the, the public will allow horse sport or the horse sector to operate with minimalised, formalised restrictions. And it will, effectively, it will allow it to self-regulate. But where the um, social licence is revoked, or indeed it gets towards being withdrawn, it can lead to restrictive regulations and indeed an outright ban. And in, as I've mentioned already, when we think about social licence in the, in the horse world, it is very much based on how the public perceives we are protecting and, and, and advancing equine welfare. And as you can see, when you think about the different levels of social licence, there are, um, I don't think, many indications where actually horse sport, for example, will get psychological identification. Um, but we can do far better to get approval. Um, but as we know in some areas, actually, we're getting dangerously clo close to that le legitimacy uh, boundary between the withholding of the social licence and it being accepted in the first place. Um, does losing social licence have consequences? Well, I would say absolutely it does, because if you look in some states in um, uh, Australia, look in many states in um, the US, greyhound racing has been banned. That was due to animal welfare concerns, both due to uh, concerns about uh, injuries with greyhounds on the track, but especially with how greyhounds were treated when their racing career was over. Um, and in all bar one states now in Australia, there is no national hunt racing. Having been, not long ago, a fairly vibrant national hunt racing, uh, at least in two or three of Australia state. And again, it's due to concerns, especially within racing, around catastrophic injuries on the race course. And so, unless we do um, something about it, unless we um, actively recognise that there is a, a challenge here, um, if, we d if we just simply stick our heads in the sand, uh, we will reach a dangerous tipping point between that formalised regulation comes in. Because we know what happens when you get bad press, um, that equates into a significant lobby to... Um, to politicians, and when politicians get involved, then regulation cannot be too far down the road. And it is worth noting that here in the UK, that in the last uh, general election, only one political party, the Conservative Party, did not support actually having an independent welfare regulator for, for, for racing. And so it is, you know, the times are changing, and we need to recognise that it's not something that's happening just in Australia or the US, it is very much happening here. And a, a key point here to recognise is that each and every one of us, whether you are a groom, a rider, someone in the equestrian trade, someone who's a sponsor, we all have a role uh, to enhance and protect the horse sector's social licence. Um, and that is a really important thing to remember. So getting towards something a bit more relevant, I think, to, to equestrian trade, what, is, what's, what makes up social licence? Well, without doubt... Having a shared values creates the trust, is the best way of creating trust. And it is trust that underpins social licence. It's the trust from the general public that, in our case, we will care for the number one stakeholder in the horse-human partnership, namely the, the, the horse. 
And, and when I think about shared values, it, racing is a good example, because some, some of you will be very familiar with, with the racing world, but when we ask, and this is very well documented across the world, when you ask the general public what their concerns are around equine welfare in racing, number one is generally injuries uh, and deaths on the race course. Number two is the whip. Now, we can have a, a wonderful discussion around the welfare implications of the use of the whip. And to be fair, the scientific basis is not that clear cut. But I think it's not um, only a matter of welfare, it's also a matter of ethics. Um, and ethics is what is right to do, in this case, for, for the care of our animals. And it doesn't matter how much we rile, or those in racing rile, and say, the whip is not a welfare issue. If the public think the whip is a welfare issue, then you have a problem. And so we do need to find out what the public think uh, are important in terms of equine welfare. It's not always so you have to make changes, as I've said. Sometimes it's so you can actually establish what the justification is for you to um, undertake that particular activity. So what social licence is all about is that we need the public to, to, to see that we are transparent and competent in what we do and we have the credibility and legitimacy to self-regulate. And what I'll do now is just touch on a few of these other aspects that make up social licence. So, but when we think about social licence, um, uh, what, what do we mean? Well, of course, equine welfare is, is, is paramount, is, is, is critical. Uh, but it isn't just about equine welfare. It is about being a bit proactive, talk, thinking about the ethics, as I've just mentioned, in relation to the whip. It's certainly about education, because that is what's going to create the long-term change. And it is about communicating how we communicate. If we're doing the best job in the world and we're not telling anyone about it, then we, as far as social licence is concerned, can have um, a real problem. So what I want to do now is just bring this to life through some examples of existing products. And I want to have a clear health warning here. Um, these are examples that just try to illustrate a number of the areas that I just wanted to talk about, I've just mentioned on a previous slide. And so I want to, hopefully you will focus on the message. Certainly the examples I'm giving are not endorsements, and you might well have better examples, and it'd be great to touch on that in the Q&A. So just to go on and talk about the, the responsibilities, as I said, but also the opportunities that uh, social licence does bring. So we've talked about establishing trust, and of course that is critical uh, to um, protecting and enhancing social licence. And when we think about that, domesticated horses and ponies have a relatively high incidence of health conditions that could be prevented if we think more about the physiological makeup of the horses. And when we think of the challenges that we have for, within equine welfare in the UK and in many other parts of the world, Laminitis, which is greatly predisposed to by equine obesity. Colic, which obviously has many risk factors, um, and owner's management does not always optimise risk reduction when it comes to colic, nor does it come to risk reduction when it comes to gastric ulcers. So we can reduce some of these issues, and we can reduce this risk by promoting nutrition that aligns with high forage intake and concentrate feeds that are low in starch. And a few examples here, this time from Dodson and Horrell, you know, a go light balancer, which is a low calorie balancer, suitable for good doers, and there's certainly lots of good doers in the UK today, and those prone to laminitis, which is low in starch, sugar, and of course calories. Then obviously fibre fusion, which is a low starch and high oil blend of fibres, and of course, for the horse sport, or for, for the horse that is used more in sport, the elite sport muesli, which is a high performance feed for a very active horse, but one that is prone to gastric ulcers and therefore has a low starch product in, in, in this particular feed, but also I know there's low starch um, equivalents in many other performance regions of, of feeds. So that's just one example of how we can establish trust by actually taking a step back and reflecting how we can can ensure that the products that we are using with our horses actually re reflects how horses best, their physiology best works. 
So, and secondly, around tra facilitating transparency. That is an cr equally critical part of that social license makeup. Because if we can facilitate transparency, then we are going to certainly help that public trust. And the example uh, we, we found here was, was Equitrace. Obviously, this is a, a, an app, a phone app, combined with a microchip. And what we really liked about this was the fact it prior prioritizes horse welfare management and makes it easy to get the horses the right treatment at the right time and also, as it happens, recommends drug withdrawal times, particularly relevant to horse sport. So it's sort of akin to an electronic tamper-proof ledger of the horse's location, health and medical records. And so that really does increase transparency, which fosters trust. But also, as I'll mention in a second, it actually has real benefits to the owner at the same time. And I think it's really important when we think about products that we want to promote to people, yes, it's going to work for a short time if it's used with a stick um, and you're doing it because it's a threat to welfare if they don't. But more times they will use it if actually there's real benefit to them. So then if we think about espousing, you know, I talked a lot about shared values just now, and I think it is really important that we consider how best we can espouse society values in how we care and manage for our horses and how we can utilise uh, products that do exactly that. Maintaining a horse's physical and mental well-being is, of course, paramount. And it's you know, a critical part of social license. And the, issue, the utilization of a product called Stride Safe, this is something that's used in the US. I don't think it's used much in the UK at the moment, but some might tell me that I'm wrong on that. But it's a non invasive screening device system that identifies horses, it looks at Stride's length and stride frequency and can potentially be an advanced warning system for a risk of musculoskeletal injury. And that's being actively used by the New York Racing Association. But there are numerous items for, um, that, for items that provide enrichment for horses. I know if Professor Nat Warren was here, she always has a bit of an issue with the term enrichment because actually the way a lot of people use enrichment sort of... Um, assets actually are to make uh, up for shortfalls in the way that an animal is being kept. And if that is the case, then it's not enrichment at all, because enrichment is actually taking an uh, animal that's in, a, in an acceptable uh, environment and actually advancing it even further, not bringing it up just to the acceptable. But obviously, through mirrors, we can provide that company for horses, and we, we can obviously, very importantly, within the management of obesity um, and horses that that might suffer with boredom if we are trying to sort of um, manage their weight. You know, the, the, all sorts of um, uh, hay feeder balls and different devices used to prolong feeder time. Then we need to think, of course, the horse as a primary stakeholder how we can best um, prioritise their welfare. Because that, without doubt, has a fundamental and important part in terms of maintaining social licence. And there's lots of opportunities here to provide pr products. And I've just given two here. One, Westgate Labs, which obviously is a business based on helping owners to maintain horse health whilst championing responsible use of antihelmintics and environmental responsibility. And we know, um, as we heard, in fact, I was talking to Liz before um, uh, over lunch, you know, something that the National Equine Forum covered very, uh, very well earlier this year is the fact that possibly one of the biggest threats to equine welfare in this country is the growing crisis we have in the fact that we have no new antihelmintic products coming on the market and increasing resistance in all of the ones that are available. So actually ways that we can promote owners and get owners to change their behaviour in terms of how they worm their horses is so important. But also then spillers who have a, a Facebook group, to, uh, sort of a slimmers club, and through that they will um, donate funding to Red Wings Horse Sanctuary, um, a charity that we work very closely with. So they're just a, a, few, a few examples of prioritising welfare. Another aspect of um, social licence is demonstrating competence. That is so important in the horse world. I'm sure many of you will recognise that there are lots of people in the horse world who will give you a chapter and Bible on what they know and what they know is right, but actually when you challenge them, 
sensitively and just politely, actually, it's their opinion. Um, and whilst opinions can be informed, of course they can, um, actually, it is the science, if, if it's available, and it can be um, brought to bear, that will have far more um, uh, impact, because it will create that competence which in itself will build trust. And so well-designed research papers in peer-reviewed jur review journals demonstrate that in it's the independence of that process that deems that the public will deem then that company is competent and a product worthy of its flame claims and therefore a couple of examples here the the, the um uh, research done around Fairfax bridles and the research done by Science Supplement, Science Supplement's Flexibility Supplement. Now, obviously, when you look at, certainly when I looked at um, the, the Flexibility Supplement from Science Supplement, that's not a cheap product. Um, but sometimes, as, you, as we know, when we think a bit more broadly around animal welfare, you need to invest in these things, and it does, it, it's not uh, cost-free. So sometimes there is a challenge there in getting people, especially in the world we're currently living in, to get people to understand that sometimes they need to spend a bit more, and they possibly won't be wasting their money on other things where, when, when they're spending a bit less. Being proactive, I, I struggled slightly with this one because I couldn't, wasn't quite sure of the best product to use. And I don't believe Horse Pal, which is a, a rug monitor, uh, comes onto the market until later this year. But uh, rugs is a really interesting uh, topic because I spend most of the time telling people don't put rugs on your horses um, and only put rugs on your horses when you really need to. Uh, but there's no doubt some horses do need rugging. And the idea of having some simple device that can actually let... Uh, owners know when they might actually be over-rugging their horse through the temperature and humidity under that rug is actually a really a useful tool to have. And I think, you know, if we can do more of that, um, and of course this is another example where the importance of actually having products that, that, where there's a real benefit to the owner um, um, is, is obviously going to, from a non-welfare perspective, is going to far more likely to have success. I mentioned about education. Of course, you know, it is pivotal. Um, we do face a real challenge in the, in the horse world now. Uh, the fact that there are many people um, uh, who come into equine ownership who haven't had the traditional rural upbringing. And actually, of course, we want to welcome people from all sort of backgrounds and sectors into the horse world. But sometimes we can't take it as read that they have that underlying sort of livestock uh, understanding. And therefore, actually, promoting education is a is, is, there is no better way than sort of promoting a company's um, sort of social license credentials than show what it does put in to um, education. And here I've just used uh, a few examples. And it is relevant whether you're a scientist, a vet, an owner, or, a, or, or any other type of involvement. Waltham Equine Science Group or Spillers, in, we looked in, in March 2021, they clocked up 100 research papers relating to equine metabolic syndrome, obesity, laminitis, and weight management. And that obviously feeds into uh, knowledge at all levels. Bailey's Horse Feeds, I was hearing about over lunch, but they have an excellent weight loss program, which I believe is going to be adv advanced further uh, later in the year. And here, World Horse Welfare, um, earlier this year, we produced... Um, some bridal fit guidance um, off the back of some research that came up a few years ago specifically around noseband tightness and this was conducted and produced with the, with the help of Fairfax. So actually that promotion of education is fundamental in underpinning um, b b um, anyone involved in um, the, the sort of beaters world or in the welfare world to actually inform owners about how to best to protect equine welfare and therefore the overall so, so social license. Communication is really important. The example I often use here is um, the one... Um, in ra again, in racing, th th there's been a huge amount of work done in racing to reduce 
um, catastrophic fatalities on race courses. Um, and over the last decade, there has been a reduction in the number of horses that are fatally injured on the race course, which is obviously very good news and some really good work done into it. But the way that it often come across, I would seriously question. Because if you look at it from the, gen the, uh, the lens of the general public, if you say to them, we killed less horses this year than we did last year, that is going to come across in a very different light. So I think that communication and how we communicate, especially in the world of social media, is really important. And so here we've used the example of Equitrace and you know, using mainstream non-equestrian media, in this case in the Irish Times, or StrideSafe, the product I mentioned earlier, which certainly very effectively use mainstream media in the equestrian world. Science supplements, I mentioned earlier, a very eff effective Facebook campaign, and Twitter, uh, uh, Fairfax Saddles equally did a very good um, uh, campaign around um, uh, Twitter. Um, so, finally, um, before I, I wrap up, I think it is really important that, of course, and it probably is the statement of the bleeding obvious, but we have to be ethical in what we are doing and in the equestrian trade perspective in what we are selling and if some products aim to change a horse behavior when actually improving their training might be a better solution such as the use of bit brushes i think it is highly questionable so, somewhat of an extreme example but some products aim to change a horse's performance in a ways that are unnatural and um, in detrimental to the long-term soundness of that, uh, that horse. And of course, there can be fewer more graphic examples than the horrific uh, uh, issue with Tennessee walking horses and the products that are used, in this case, sort of stacked shoes and chains to, to create this horrific action known as the big, big lick. And of course, some products have no science basis in science. Now, it won't surprise you that the magic supplement made up of salt uh, is a made-up thing just for today, but I think there is an element of truth in it. If there is no basis in science, it is completely unethical for us to be promoting a product from that. And um, forgive the somewhat macabre uh, cartoon, but I thought, of course, you know, we have products and it's very important to market those products. But, of course, you can spend all the time in the world designing well-designed products, but you have to market them in an ethical way. And it has to be honest and transparent. And, well, it tends to overheat. Um, uh, the, the hottest product on the market uh, is, is an interesting one. I won't even go to the one on the right. But clearly how we promote and market our products needs to be ethical. So um, I'm going to summarise. Um, you know, social licence um, is, is, allows us, as a sector to operate with minimalized restrictions. It allows us to self-regulate. And we need a social license, and it's underpinned by doing right by our horses and being seen to do right by our horses. So communication in this is so important. Our understanding of equine welfare is changing, and we have to ensure that the way we manage and care for our horses and the products we use with our horses changes with that um, ch changing understanding. And as I said earlier on, it's as, imp as important to give our horses positive experiences to give them a good life as it is to make sure we avoid negative experiences. And of course, ultimately, from a... From a and perspective for today, actually designing a market and products that will facilitate the maintenance of um, equestrianism social license is a huge opportunity. Yes, it's a responsibility, but it's also an opportunity. And I hope that the examples I've given today you know, are just a, a, a toe in the water or what is already out there. But what for sure is that we're going to have to have a lot more out there as we go forward. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much. That was a very, very important presentation for all of us. Um, a huge amount of food to thought. I've never been happier to let a speaker overrun. <laughs> and that means we don't really have time for many questions. We've got a cracking question from Liz Benwell um, on the live stream, I think, which Claire's going to read out. 
and it touches a theme we talked about just before you spoke, Rowley. Um, we'd all agree that equine obesity is a massive equine welfare problem, but perhaps not one understood by the general public who would be more concerned about thin horses. Do feed companies have a special responsibility in this respect? Feed companies, without doubt, have a, yes, a, a, a special responsibility. They have a responsibility. Um, and I think, you know, just like owners have a responsibility, just like welfare organisations have a responsibility. And I think it is a real challenge. The fact that, um, in fact, I was talking about it yesterday around the challenge in the showing world, and many of you will have seen um, the, the, the kickback from the Royal Windsor Horse Show when a number of uh, horses got first place in the, in the showing ring, uh, which I would describe as um, overweight, dare, dare I say, uh, dare, dare obese. So it is a real challenge, but I think um, what we need to recognise with equine obesity, and it's certainly something from the equine welfare perspective, is a lot of people, um, if you have an underweight horse, there can be a number of reasons for it, but often, you know, it's, it's either neglect or, or either because it's, the horse has got a problem or it's just not being fed enough. But actually, a lot of the time, when you talk about obesity, people are sort of are killing it with kindness, killing their horses with kindness. And so that's a really different mindset. And a real challenge that we all face, feed companies as well, is human behaviour change and how we can get owners to change. I mentioned anti-helminthic resistance. There's a real challenge there too. So I think in all of these things, it's so important that we work together. Um, and especially with regards to equine obesity, we know within the human sphere um, that if you just tell people, well, to think of smoking, say, you know, smoking kills, but lots of people still smoke. Um, if you have a parent and their child is overweight, if the doctor says their child is overweight, they're probably not going to do anything about it. You need to actually work with people, and it's the language we use. A, it's going to be sensitive. Sometimes you have to be direct, but sometimes you, more often you need to be sensitive. But you also need, there's a various, you can have a way and a message you want to get across, but there's different ways of getting there, and it's not always a direct way. And secondly, it's the terminology we use. And when we think about obesity, there is, within the horse side, uh, two very uh, standard scales used, the 0 to 5 scale and the 1 to 9 scale. We can't even agree amongst ourselves which is the better one to use. Lord knows how we're going to convince owners when, when your horse is a condition score of 4. Well, what does that mean? Uh, so I think there is um, a collective responsibility, yeah. So the straight answer is yes, but... Thank you. I'm really sorry, everybody. Uh, I'm, you, you're not dashing off, are you? People will be able to capture a coffee at the end. Thank you so much. That was an excellent, excellent presentation. And um, <laughs> what a great... Uh, um, what really doesn't know is obviously labelling and regulation, regulation is really my thing. And so when you put up your... your um, mythical supplement products with its crazy claims. Um, you sort of lit the blue touch paper there. So how better to follow that with the regulatory team <laughs> um, from the FSA, Amanda and Dean. <laughs>